It's Saturday morning at 10 a.m., so you know what that means. It's time for What's Up, Ocala? With tens of thousands of viewers every month on our YouTube channel and millions so far on TikTok, we are joined by our host, local owner and broker of Great Expectations Realty, Andrea Praber. Good morning and welcome to What's Up, Ocala. I'm your host, Andrea Praber broker of Great Expectations Realty right here in Ocala, Florida. And uh, today we're actually going to be talking about sinkholes. I know some of y'all are really looking forward to getting more info on that. So imagine you're you're here, there's been a lot of sinkholes popping up after a really big storm called Tropical Storm Debbie back in 2012. And sinkholes are those holes that suddenly appear in the ground, which can be really scary. Now, the Florida government, of course, wants to figure out why these sinkholes are happening and where they might pop up next. So they get together and ask a group called the Florida Geological Survey, or FGS, to help them out. They want to figure this out. Well, the FGS uses a special technique called weights of evidence, or W of E, to study lots of different information about the ground in Florida to see where sinkholes are more likely to happen and where they could happen next. This group didn't just kind of sit at their desks and guess, or you know, based off the reports that came in, they actually sent out teams to explore over 3,600 places all around Florida to check for signs of sinkholes. So after spending about three and a half years doing this, they ended up mapping over 700 sinkholes, 705 to be exact. Well, then they take all this information and they made a really cool map that shows which areas of Florida are more likely to have sinkholes. Then they divided the map into four sections from places where sinkholes are less likely, such as the Everglades, very, very not likely to have a sinkhole in the Everglades, to places where they're much more likely, like Pasco County. That one's a high risk for sinkhole county. So this map can help local governments make plans to help citizens and their homes them safe from future sinkholes. So very cool. And the cool thing is that they didn't just make like a regular paper map, of course. They made a digital version that's really detailed and, we can, and it can actually integrate with other maps super easily. So this digital map is like this huge giant grid covering Florida and each square on the grid has information about how likely it is to have a sinkhole. But it's not like they just started tracking them like, you know, right after this tropical storm Debbie. Uh, No, they actually began tracking sinkholes or trying to track sinkholes back in the 1950s. The Florida Geological Survey, or FGS, actually started something called the Florida Sinkhole Index, which was used to keep track of sinkholes for scientific reasons. So they asked, like, they didn't actually go out. They actually asked, like, regular people, like you and me, um, as well as, of course, local government agencies to just, you know, report something if they saw something. If they saw anything that might be a sinkhole or, you know, some kind of hole in the ground or something like that, just go ahead and call it in, you know. This was all before the internet, before cell phones. They did the best they could with the technology they had. So we're just going to bless their hearts and move on. (laughs) So not all of these reports, obviously, were accurate or checked by experts to make sure that they were accurate. So that's about what you got out of it. In the early 1980s, they actually moved this data to a new place called the Florida Sinkhole Research Institute. FSRI. They tried to get even more reports, but still, again, uh, not all of them were double checked by actual scientists uh, or people that knew uh, the difference between a man made hole in the ground and uh, a sinkhole. So eventually, in 1992, the FSRI was shut down and the FGS started handling the data all over again. So there's like failed attempt, basically. Like before, most of the reports were just people who saw something and it looked like a sinkhole, but it wasn't really verified information by experts that actually knew what they were looking at. So currently, most reports come from the state watch office of the Department of Emergency Management. And they actually do still have a form that people can fill out if they think they've spotted a sinkhole. But then it's normally followed up with actual 
experts. Um, other reports do come from regular folks who just send in reports or call the FGS directly, especially in rural areas. Uh, sometimes in big emergencies, like after a really big storm or a freeze, the FGS geolog- geologists, excuse me, I can talk today, they go out and they actually check the sink for sinkholes themselves. Uh, but here's the tricky part. <laughs> Not everything that was reported Uh, if it's not checked out, is actually a sinkhole. Sometimes it's actually um, something that's just causing the ground to sink, like, I don't know, broken pipes or buried trash. I know you can laugh, and yet I may have seen a few in-ground pools that people try to fill in with old couches and carpets. So let's not laugh too hard, okay? Your neighbors are doing these things. It's tough to say for sure if all the reports are accurate. I'm going to go with probably not, but at least some of the data is. Um, Plus, the data tends to be more from areas where more people live, so it's not really going to give you a really good picture of where sinkholes really happen, especially in those remote and rural areas, like maybe the Ocala National Forest. And then we get to the fun of 2008. Oh, boy. Uh, That was when a whole slew of people were claiming to have a sinkhole to their insurance companies because they were underwater on their mortgage. Uh, I cannot tell you the thousands of homes that have prior sinkhole reported on the county property card when in reality, mm, there was never a sinkhole at all. So basically, because of the the push for fraudulent insurance claims at that time, I mean, you know, people were pretty desperate. There were thousands of sinkholes reported to the government in an incredibly short amount of time during the recession, which nobody knows for sure which ones are real and which ones just needed to get out of a mortgage and nobody knows. So... Um, anyway, despite all of the changes or maybe because of them, the FGS was asked by the Department of Emergency Management to make this map um, showing where sinkholes might be more likely to form in Florida. And they're going to do that with a whole lot of technology. Um, they use these you know, fancy computer techniques called spatial statistic modeling And they started with a much smaller study in a few northern counties in Florida and then expanded it statewide from there. So they started small, got the program, the system down pat, made sure their equipment was working and went from there. So while the data on the sinkholes hasn't been perfect, because again, it's it's not a perfect science, um, the efforts are still being made to understand and to map them better and to keep everyone safe from, well, you know, unexpected holes opening up in the ground and, you know, eating your house. So <laughs> that's, we don't want that to happen. So let's kind of talk about a little bit about what sinkholes are, where they might be, how you can spot them, all that fun stuff. So very simply put, because I am a very simple person, there are two types of sinkholes normally. So they're subsidence sinkholes and collapse sinkholes. And they're both kind of not fun surprises in the ground, but they form in very different ways and have very different risks. So first up, we're going to go over the subsidence sinkholes. These take their time forming. Um, Picture this. Sediment like dirt and rocks, they're slowly, very slowly in some cases, washed down into tiny little, tiny little cracks in the ground below. So over time, this can actually create a sinkhole or maybe just a slight depression on the ground. Uh, They can take anywhere from months to millions of years to form. Okay, these, these, these are not quick, drastic things. They also come in all sizes from itty bitty ones that are just a few inches across to big ones that stretch for hundreds of feet. So while they don't usually put lives in danger, they can definitely cause a lot of problems for buildings and and stuff over long stretches of time. If you think about how old some of the buildings here in Marion County are, yeah, you could see if it had something like that going on, even though it's years and years and years, it can still be an issue. All right, now onto the collapse sinkholes. These are the ones oh, that you've probably seen on the news. They're the fast movers of the sinkhole world. Um, they're also the ones that get the most media attention and they get lots of pictures taken of them. And they're very, very traumatic and very scary. And these are the ones that form when the ground suddenly caves in because there's a hollow space just underneath that can't support the weight above it. 
So it's kind of like uh, uh, the roof of a cave collapsing. That's a collapse sinkhole. And they pop out of nowhere and can keep growing for hours, days, or even months after the initial collapse. So just like the subsidence sinkholes, they come in all sizes and shapes. But uh, here's the thing. Collapse sinkholes can be really dangerous because it's so sudden. And they can cause serious damage to buildings and unfortunately put lives at risk too because, you know, what if it opens up on a road? You're driving along, there was a road, now there's not. Not good, not good. So when it comes to the size and the shape of these sinkholes, it really depends on a bunch of stuff underground, like how deep and how wide the gap in the rock or the sediment is and how strong the ground above it is. So how much... How much water is around? Um, what kind of stuff is on top of it? I mean, there's just, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, if there's a huge, big, massive gap down there, you might get a big sinkhole on the surface. And um, if it's a smaller gap, you're probably just going to end up with an, a smaller sinkhole. That's just how it works. Uh, it's just trying to fill the gap. The, site, the type of sinkhole that's formed also depends on what's sitting on top of the rock. Most of Florida, <laughs> it's got layers of sediment covering the rock. So that plays a really big role in how sinkholes are formed. We, of course, have so much lime rock here. It, it, that's, that's really kind of the issue. So if you ever want to actually visit a sinkhole and actually see it from the inside out, I know it sounds terrifying, right? But you could actually go over to Williston and go swimming in one. This is a place you may have heard of. It's called Devil's Den. I've been there multiple times. In fact, I was just there with my family a few weeks back, and it is amazing. If you've never heard of it, basically imagine a river flowing real peaceful like beneath the earth's surface, and then it's completely hidden from view. Nobody even knows it's there. And now picture the roof of this underground river completely collapsing. And now you can see the river and it's, you know, revealing the water out to that open air above. That's exactly what happened at Devil's Den. And it's forming what we call as a karst window, K-A-R-S-T, in case you're curious. Well, the Devil's Den is privately owned and it's actually a hub for scuba diving, training, and snorkeling. We do the snorkeling. I love that. And it's just like water in any of Central Florida's you know, natural artesian springs, the water is crystal clear and stays at a slightly chilly 72 degrees all year round. So back in the day, getting into Devil's Den was really quite the adventure. Uh, any of the visitors, they had to squeeze through this really small solution sinkhole that was kind of to the side just to get to the water. But um, back in the 1990s, they actually widened the opening a little, still pretty tight, to make it a little more ac accessible for everyone. But it's single family, <laughs> single file going in and if you're trying to go out while someone else is coming up especially if they have scuba equipment one of you is going to have to wait because there is no room for passing <laughs> anyway once you're inside you're going to be completely surrounded by these beautiful rock walls and just this gorgeous cave and the light coming in from above is just gorgeous and then there's all this water i don't know the whole shape is kind of like an inverted mushroom that's what they they refer to it as it's kind of just this m amount of water underneath and anyway the water again crystal clear and there's some pretty good sized fish and turtles and stuff in there too it's not like it's just water it's a river so if you're feeling really adventurous you can go cave scuba diving and explore the four underwater passages uh, some of which contain some really fascinating remains and artifacts that go back to the time when there were like saber-toothed cats and mastodons and stuff like that. I wouldn't know. I, I go scuba or sc snorkeling in that area. <laughs> Cave diving is not my thing. And I actually stay where the sun is shining down. Uh, I am way too chicken to go cave diving. <laughs> I've heard things. I don't, um, mm -mm. I don't care what the artifacts are over there. I don't need to see them. <laughs> so while sinkholes might seem like they just kind of pop up randomly, um, there's actually a lot going on underneath uh, that actually determines how and when they will appear and how long they last. And it's actually really cool to be able to see it firsthand from underneath in a place like the Devil's Den. What does this all have to do with real estate? Well, I have been asked so many times, is it safe to buy a house with a prior sinkhole that's been fixed? Oh boy. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's the truth. Um, 
I've, I've often seen people advertise houses that have had uh, sinkhole issues in the past and were, they call it remediated. Uh, sometimes they'll even say things like, well, now that this home has been remediated and it's all done, it's even safer than a house that's never had a sinkhole. Ugh, I honestly don't know if that's true. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know that it's not, but what can happen to those houses, even after they seem to be fixed up, is maybe the sinkhole f- it wasn't completely filled and, and it forms and you know people try fixing it, like filling it in or plugging it up and they may think everything's all good again, but sometimes even after it's been fixed, the sinkhole can come back to life, so to speak. So yeah, it, that's, it's not a sure thing. And, and just like how a collapsed sinkhole can cause collapsing and getting bigger over time, a sinkhole that's been fixed up with a remediation might suddenly start acting up again, sometimes even several years in the, in the future. Now, why does that happen? Well, <laughs> there's a few different possible reasons. One is that when the sinkhole was filled, maybe it wasn't completely filled. So there was still some empty space down there and then you're, you're gonna have those gaps again. Another reason could be that the stuff that fell into the hole in the first place, like possibly a portion of the driveway or something, um, it gets moved around because there's water flowing underground and that can actually create more gaps and more holes. And sometimes it's a mix of both of those things that's happening. So it it could be a lot of things. Um, So even though it might seem like the problem's been solved, sinkholes can be sneaky and they can come back when you least expect it. So, you know, it's kind of a good reminder that when it comes to dealing with sinkholes, it's really, really important to keep an eye out for any signs of, of trouble or, or issues, even, even after they've been fixed up. You, you don't want to know that you're on firm ground and firm solid ground when you might not really be. So, all right, so what can cause a sinkhole to form? Well, uh, again, two main things that can naturally trigger a sinkhole, which is drought and heavy rainfall, especially when it's drought quickly followed by heavy rainfall. Uh, So let's talk about the drought. When there's not enough rain for a long time, the groundwater levels in the underground aquifers can drop. Well, that's gonna cause some issue with pressure. Uh, Usually the water in these aquifers help support the ceilings of any gaps or holes in the ground, but when the levels uh, of those water go down, that support disappears and then the ceilings can't stay held up anymore. So they collapse and that can form a sinkhole on the surface. Um, There's also this thing called uh, shrink swell clays in the soil that can shrink a lot during a drought. So I don't know if you've ever done much with clay, but uh, it definitely changes things, especially size once you add or remove water from it. So so all of that can contribute to a sinkhole formation, but it's not as big a deal as uh, the drop in the groundwater levels. That's that's a big one. So, all right, now on to heavy rainfall. That's the one I definitely have, have seen issues with. When there's a huge, big downpour, we're talking over a couple of days especially, it can cause sinkholes in a few different ways. Uh, first off, all that extra water adds weight to the soil and the rocks and it's on top of any gaps or holes in the ground and that extra weight can sometimes cause the ceiling of the hole to collapse also when it rains a lot water can collect in low areas and seep into the ground and there's weight to that water and and if there's a hole down there the weight of the water and the the very fast infiltration of all of that water coming in can cause the ceiling to cave in another way (laughs) When there's been a lot of rain over a long time and the ground is already completely saturated, the soil can get soft and it can get weak. So when heavy rainfall hits, it can weaken the ground even more leading to sinkholes. So whether it's too dry or too wet, the ground can sometimes, you know, uh, give us a surprise with a sinkhole. Ah, fun. (laughs) So, okay, but those are the things that can trigger a sinkhole naturally. So what else can do it? Well, we humans uh, do uh, sometimes lead, um, we can do things that lead to sinkholes forming. We're constantly changing the world around us, right? We do, we, we change things constantly. So sometimes those changes 
uh, can affect the ground beneath us and uh, not always in a good way. One big thing uh, we can do that can cause sinkholes is, of course, pumping out the groundwater or aggressively pumping out the groundwater, I should say. Uh, of course, we need water to live. Of course, you know, we need to have clean drinking water and all of that. Um, so we pump a lot of it out of the ground every day. In fact, in Florida, more than 4 billion gallons are pumped out. When we take too much water out, it can lower the water le water levels in the underground. So even if we're not going through a drought, it basically has the same effect. So this can make that ground above those aquifers weaken and sometimes even cause sinkholes to form. There's a, an example of places uh, like over in Tampa and Plant City where they pump a lot of water for farming or for bottling. And there have been cases where aggressive pumping have actually triggered sinkholes, like as they're actually pumping the water out. Another way that we can mess with the ground is by changing the landscape. Like when we dig up a whole bunch of earth for like mining or um, maybe building things like roads and buildings, sometimes by removing too many layers of so soil or rock, it can expose the underlying rocks, which can be prone to forming sinkholes. So uh, when we change how water flows on the surface, like with stormwater management, which is a wonderful thing, but not necessarily also great for sinkhole uh, issues, um, it can sometimes lead to water seeping into the ground in areas uh, that are already going to have problems and um, it can actually cause sinkholes. And of course, let's not forget about all the stuff that we bury underground like pipes and wells and all of that stuff. And sometimes those pipes leak or break and they can actually create pathways for water to flow underground and that can lead to sinkholes forming as well. So there have been cases where sinkholes have actually formed under those drill rigs while the wells are being drilled. Some very interesting pictures. You can see them online. While we might not always realize that, you know, our our actions up here on the surface can have a huge impact on the ground beneath us. It's a good reminder to be mindful and to try and take steps to minimize our impact whenever possible. I know that's not always possible, but we can at least try. What's actually being done? Uh, well, that cool tool I told you about, the W of E model that was used to figure out where the sinkholes might be more likely to form in Florida. Well, it's kind of a special map. And that is now helping us to understand which areas of the state have the right conditions for sinkholes to pop up. Uh, the one caveat to that that I, <laughs> I would mention is it's not in the predictive phase exactly and precisely where sinkholes will happen. It's a, a, a general idea. OK, um, at least it's not there yet anyway. Um, instead, it just kind of helps us pinpoint areas that have the right geological phenomena for, you know, lots of sinkholes to form, especially during those big events like heavy rainfall from tropical storms or hurricanes or, and stuff like that. And it, it's also after, of course, a long dry spell uh, when there's like sudden changes in water levels underground or due to aggressive pumping activities, like I said, mentioned down, down in the Tampa area. But the cool thing about the model is that it's based on a a type of statistic called Bayesian statistics, which it takes a lot of the guesswork out of the process. So they actually came up with this scientific way of doing it. And it also helps to make sure that the results are reliable and accurate. And it's actually proving to be so. So this model does seem to work and scientists, in order to do it, they had to crunch a lot of data. Uh, we're talking like terabytes of information, like a lot of information was put into it to get information out. Uh, it's also important to remember that the data isn't perfect. They're trying. They're doing the best they can, but it is not perfect. There might be some gaps and some errors here and there. Um, plus, the map they came up with is, again, it's kind of a snapshot in time. So as new data comes in, they're going to need to update the map to keep it accurate. Because, again, as we play with the top and the surface of the ground, it's going to change the underground as well. Basically, it's split into least favorable, favorable, more favorable, and most favorable favorable for sinkholes. I, I don't really think that I would like to use the word favorable for sinkholes. I don't think they're favorable, but that it is what it is. Anyway, so that's what the folks over at the Division of Emergency Management are doing because 
it, it kind of gives them a heads up on where they might need to focus their efforts in order to prepare or for preparation for a sinkhole events in the future. All right, now here's the thing. This map is really useful, but it's not meant to tell us exactly where each sinkhole will appear. Okay, so it's not like you can zoom in super, super well on individual specific parcels or something. It's more about getting a general idea of which parts of the state might be more at risk. Okay, I cannot reiterate that enough. Do not say, is it on the map? Is this particular address? That's not what it's for. It's just a very nifty tool to get a better understanding of where sinkholes might pop up in Florida. And that helps us stay prepared for whatever's thrown our way. They are already working on some really cool ideas for improvements that could help us get a much clearer picture. I don't know if it's going to be down to the street address, but... (laughs) at least a clearer picture of what's going on underground. Uh, That includes working on refining the data that was used to create the maps in the first place. And again, it was a lot of information to go through. It, It will probably take decades to get through all of it accurately. And they might need to get more information as they're going through that data because again, we have changes. They could also add more data from across the whole state. All right, so info about the rocks, the soil, all of that below the surface, that is something that they're wanting to do. One super helpful thing would be to have what's called um, seamless statewide LIDAR. And I know that sounds like really fancy and super high tech, but basically it's this type of technology that uses lasers to create really, really detailed maps of the ground, like very laser focused kind of detailed maps. So having that kind of mapping would be a game changer. It would be extremely accurate. Um, And it would make it much easier to spot areas where sinkholes might form. And get this, if the government could get LIDAR data for several years in a row, they could then track changes over time. And that means we could actually see if certain areas are getting even more prone to sinkholes or if there are other geological things happening underground. So amazing. But again, to do a laser on the entire state, that's, that's, that's going to take some time and effort right there. <laughs> uh, another idea they have is to focus on each county individually because different counties have different things going on underground. And so by studying them separately, we can get a better understanding of what's happening at a local level. And that would be fantastic. This would really help the planning and zoning department and um, the government as a whole to figure out what areas would be a great place to put a road or a parking lot or a retention pond um, in what, you know, while they're developing the certain areas. So I think that would be helpful. Hopefully soon we can even get better at predicting and understanding the sinkholes and it means that our communities are going to be safer in the long run. So we're getting there. We've, it, we're ahead by leaps and bounds just from the beginning of this study alone. It's all about using those technology and the data that we get from that to stay ahead of the game. But I know all of this is kind of a bird's eye view from like a thousand feet up in the air. It's not really what you were thinking of when we said we were going to talk about sinkholes, but you probably want to know more what you can do personally when you are either buying your next home in Florida, or if you're already living in Florida, you already have your home. What can you personally do? Well, first off, you can easily check the County Property Appraisers website and see if any of the homes in the vicinity of you or the one you're interested in have reported or even previously repaired sinkholes. So if there was ever an insurance claim or a permit pulled, it's public record. And no, it cannot be removed. That's It's on there. So if you're worried about sinkholes that much, or if you just want, you know, some kind of peace of mind or assurance, you can get also a sinkhole inspection. Basically, a company like Geotech here in Ocala, uh, they can actually go out and they can test the soil and can even use, I believe they use ground penetrating radar to see if your potential home is on solid ground. I believe they have to do that for developments and for uh, companies, corporations coming in, but Geotech would be the ones to ask about all that stuff. Another thing you're going to want to do is to check the grading of the home. Uh, If the ground is 
higher where the house is, that means if there's heavy rainfall, the water is going to run away from the home and you're going to have less of a chance of accumulating water or rain near the foundation and causing issues in the ground below the foundation. Now, what if you already live here and you're here in Ocala and now I have freaked you right out? You are just <laughs> completely over this now going, what in the world? All right, basically, it's okay. It's the same advice. You're gonna keep the water away from your house. I know it's common not to have a gutter system on your home. It's probably, you know, one out of four houses have them here, but maybe go ahead and look into doing something like that. Um, taking all that heavy rainfall away from your house with an excellent gutter system can do wonders for maintaining your foundation, uh, just wonders for the house as a whole. So if you start to see some signs of a sinkhole or a ground depression, go ahead and get an inspection on it. You know, don't wait. You you definitely want to going to want to take some steps to get the water away from your home now and find out if your property may have an issue before a very small issue becomes a much larger kind of scary issue. All right, I'm not sharing all of this to scare you. I want you to know that I am here to entertain and to educate and to chit chat because I am your neighbor. I am out here too and I am honestly not alarmed by the idea of sinkholes. I know it sounds weird because I've seen them, but it, it's kind of like when somebody first moves to Florida and they are so freaked out by the alligators. And then after a few years, they're like, oh, <laughs> I mean, they do, they look scary, uh, but the chances of you actually being attacked by an alligator, they're pretty slim, you know? It, it, you know what areas to avoid, when to avoid them. And truthfully, unless you're doing something really crazy, like, you know, chasing the alligator or feeding the alligator or trying to ride the alligator. Yes, we've all seen stuff like this, especially on the the, the TikTok and the YouTube and the stuff. Anyway, the, you're much more likely to die from a bee sting than an alligator, honestly. Actually, the statistics still count those crazy people. So even if you are doing all of those crazy things, uh, you're still more likely to die from a bee sting or a car accident in Florida than all of the gators and all of the sinkholes combined, okay? This is not something that is uh, that scary, okay? It's not common, all right. I mean, seriously, I've looked it up. I've looked at the statistics. So where on earth did I get all of this information today's show? Uh, trust me, I am not that smart. Uh, I read a few government reports, uh, namely the Florida Geological Survey, which was written by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which I would be happy to share with you if you want to read through it. I definitely had a hard time staying awake for some of it, but you're more than welcome to it make sure what I'm saying is accurate. You can go ahead and send me an email at ger.expectmore at gmail.com. And I would be happy to speak to you about this or give you any phone numbers or references or on this or actually any of my shows. And, you know, I'll forward whatever info uh, I've used. Uh, but yeah. All right. So we are going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to go over all of the fun stuff you can do this weekend and the current stats on what's going on in the real estate in Marion County. All right, we'll be right back. At Great Expectations Realty, we believe that you should expect more from your real estate experience. When you hire a realtor to sell your home, you should expect experienced advice on staging your home, professional photography, aerial photos, virtual video tours, and a national presence online to advertise your home to the largest pool of buyers. Your realtor should communicate from start to finish. And always remember, this is your home. You are in the driver's seat. We believe that if you aren't happy with our efforts, you should be able to fire us. We don't have cancellation fees, and our sellers never pay transaction fees either. Call Great Expectations Realty at 352-817-9160 or go online to greatexpectationsrealty.com to get your free analysis of your home's market price. Great Expectations Realty. Expect more from real estate. 
Welcome back. All right, before we get into the sales stats this week, I want to ask a small favor. If you're enjoying this program, let us know. The website here at the radio station is classichitsocala.com. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave a comment in the description below. If you're a fan and truly think we've helped you or educated you or entertained you in some small way, share, share, share. And on YouTube, click, click subscribe if you haven't already. Now let's go ahead and jump into the real estate stats for this week here in Marion County over the last seven days. Currently, there are 333,000. Nope. So for that area, it's kind of interesting to see their annual report just came out for 2023 and I wanted to share the rest of it with you. It was absolutely fascinating. If you want the report, let me know because uh, we actually, I can just email it over to you. 23 profile of international residential transactions in Florida report. That was going into um, the decline in residential property sales for international buyers. Well, obviously we had some very interesting laws that went into effect July of uh, 2023 um, that nicks like seven countries completely from being able not only to buy, but actually to even own Florida. <laughs> like, no. Uh, but it was a significant decline. It was 18% decline in residential property sales for international buyers, you know, compared to the, the prior 12 months. So despite this decrease, the total dollar value of uh, volume of international purchases stood at $12.6 billion. So uh, they're still buying. They're still buying. Not those particular countries that are now banned, but uh, the rest of them are still buying. So speaking of Canadian buyers, I was about to say like Canada, you can still buy. Well, Canadian buyers emerged as the front runners in terms of total total dollar volume. Uh, it's accounting for $2.1 billion in purchases, which to me is a little surprising because the American dollar versus the Canadian dollar, not feeling so great. But yeah, it was $2.1 billion in Florida in purchases. Wow. Uh, it's also noteworthy that while Canadians maintained their lead, there was a notable decline in the dollar volume of purchases by buyers from Colombia, Peru, and Mexico. Very, very interesting stuff is happening internationally. Florida real estate, very interesting stuff. All right. A significant proportion, 68% of international buyers opted not to invest in Florida properties with 47% citing cost as the primary deterrent. Well, yeah, it was still kind of expensive beginning of 2023. So very interesting. 93% of international buyers visited Florida before finalizing their property purchase. So if you guys are watching this internationally, uh, we're still open for business and the prices have come down. So, you know, call me. <laughs> All right. Top five international buyers by dollar volume. Of course, we already mentioned Canada, 2.1 billion closely followed by Brazil at $1.5 billion, Colombia, $982 million, Peru, $539 million, and Mexico purchased $524 million. Top international buyer destinations in Florida, where did these people buy? Uh, well, primarily, uh, it was going to be Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, not a huge surprise there. Most of them actually bought down there. So a lot of Canadians apparently moved down there. 47% bought in that area. What about Orlando, Kissimmee, Sanford? That came in second at 14%. Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, 8%. Cape Coral, Fort Myers, 6%. And Northport, Sarasota, and Bradenton, 4%. So what do y'all have against, Can uh, against Ocala? <laughs> So they're going all throughout Florida and kind of skipping us over. And they're really not going, it doesn't look like any of that is north of us. It just kind of hit the line. So you'll you'll get to us eventually. When you see that Miami traffic, you'll definitely say, hey, you know, Ocala's not so bad. Ocala is definitely, you know, good. yeah, pretty good place to live. All right. So excluding the very volatile uh, COVID years of 2020 and 2021, last quarter's growth was the fourth fastest growing um rate during the last two decades. So that's very surprising. And again, I think it kind of had like, you know, it started with the 2021 or or that just kind of, you know, really got the momentum going, but it definitely put, especially Ocala on the map, I think. 
in some ways, literally, because it used to be that I would go to even Orlando, which is only an hour away for crying out loud. I would go to Orlando and they'd be like, oh, where are you from? I'm like, oh, Ocala. And they're like, where? I've never heard of it. You know, now they're like, oh yeah, I was just there. Oh, the World Equestrian Center is amazing. You know, and it's like, what just happened? What just happened? I've had to explain for years that I only live an hour away and now everybody seems to know where it is. All right. Insurance. I wanted to, oh, the insurance. This report was so interesting. 2017, since 2017, 11 property and casualty companies that offered homeowners insurance in Florida have liquidated. This has reduced the number of insurers and added to the pressures, driving prices up to the point of Florida being one of the nation's most expensive states for homeowner insurance. Shame, shame, shame. All right. Florida has always presented a risky market to home insurance companies due to the high threat of widespread weather-related damage and the elevated level of litigation with insurance companies. So yeah, of course we have hurricanes, but also quit suing the insurance companies. <laughs> Florida only accounts for 9% of the country's home insurance claims. It is home to 79% of the country's home insurance lawsuits. Quit suing the insurance companies. We're not going to have any left. Knock it off. While the state legislature has introduced and passed measures to try to mitigate this re these risks, the impact on affordability and availability of homeowners insurance and its effect on home sales still presents uncertainty in the market. Now, does that mean that we do not have homeowners insurance available in Florida? No, not at all. We have homeowners insurance companies. It's just some of them said, you know what? Y'all want to sue us into oblivion? We're out of here. And we're just stuck with the aftermath. So yeah, quit that. Just <laughs> please, please stop suing the insurance companies. Okay, stop it. Not good. Uh, so what am I talking about? Am I talking about, oh, you know, my house, you know, was horribly damaged and they didn't cover it. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about all of the people that decided, well, hey, you know, my roof is 20 years old and I have to get a new one. But I think you know what? I'm missing uh, three shingles or four shingles. So I'm going to go ahead and have the insurance buy me uh, a new roof. And if they don't do it, I'm going to sue them into oblivion. You know, that's that's actually insurance fraud. And uh, yeah, you may have win the, won the lawsuit. You won the battle. You lost the war. <laughs> that's what that is. So we're definitely suffering from those lawsuits. 79% of the nation's lawsuits against against uh, insurance companies was in Florida. That is craziness. So it's not because of hurricanes or sinkholes that the insurance companies got up and left. It's because of the fraudulent insurance scams regarding roofs and um, the attorneys and all of that fees that they had to pay So for several years now. So yeah, not so great. Not so great idea. It probably seemed like a great idea, but uh, you're paying for it now, huh? Because now not just your insurance premiums are going up, but now everybody's insurance premiums are going up. So not so fun. Um, again, they are trying to work with the insurance companies and make it so it is a safer place for them to carry insurance and not get sued uh, for nonsense like that. Uh, but at the same time, until that goes into place and they can resolve it so that the homeowners that actually have valid claims can still uh, make a claim on their insurance. Um, it's just, they're trying to find this happy medium so everybody can get along. And so far they've not found that. So, um, yeah, if you do not have a valid actual claim, please, please don't, please don't. It makes the rest of us suffer. Please, please just don't just pay for your roof. If it's an old roof, pay for your roof. All right. It's the joys of homeownership. <laughs> All right. So what fun stuff is there to do in Florida, in Ocala this weekend? We, of course, have the downtown market. Absolutely fantastic thing to do is go to the downtown market and don't stress about any weird weather because it's under roof. So you can enjoy rain or shine. There are food trucks with a really cool coffee kiosk outside. And there is artisans and there is uh, music and I don't know, the baked goods and the farmer's stuff. It's all fantastic. Just go out and check it out. It's going on until 2 p.m. today, as is every Saturday. Uh, the Ocala Splash Pads are open. They are now open. If you've not taken your kids to an Ocala Splash Pad, oh, they have one over at Citizen Circle. It's completely free. 
totally free. Your kids can run wild, get wet, just absolutely have a blast. They they play games. They're just, they have so much fun. They wear themselves out and then you can take them home and you can enjoy the nice quiet of a nap. It's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. And again, it's free. Use it. Do it. It's great. All right. There's a lot of music going on. Live entertainment down at the square. You got the Levitt Amp music series. There's all sorts of stuff going on with that. Uh, it is blueberry time of year. So go pick yourself. There's lots of uh, blueberry farms like Abshire Blueberry Farm is our favorite. We love it. You can go on Facebook and check out their Facebook page. Abshire Blueberry Farm absolutely beautiful place to go out and, to, and uh, pick blueberries and they will pick them for you if you want but I mean it's just so much fun to go and pick the blueberries with your family and spend some quality time together so get out there get some great pictures some great memories and pick you some blueberries and then uh, also we have the symphony under the stars coming up in May we have over in June we've got the uh small town uh, music festival. We've got Kid Rock coming to concert in Ocala. Who'd have thought that ever happened? But yes, we do. We have Kid Rock coming in concert, whole two-day music festival in June. I will be there for that. I will tell you all about it. I'll probably even have a video for you on our YouTube channel, which is at Great Expectations Realty. So youtube.com forward slash Great Expectations Realty will get you over to our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or other, please reach out. You can go ahead and leave a comment on the uh, Ocala Classic Hits uh, Facebook page or in our YouTube channel in the comments section. All right, well, that's it for this week. We will see you next week and we will be back to our regularly scheduled stats for the week, the seven-day stats for Marion County. But if you would like a copy of the 2023 market report from our local MLS, I will be more than happy to get that over to you. Just let me know that you'd like a copy. All right, thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to What's Up Ocala? Follow us all week on Andrea Praber's YouTube channel and TikTok. We'll see you next week at 10 a.m. on What's Up Ocala.